Yep. Good morning. Again, my name is Brian Phillips. I, I know I've met many of you, but there's a few of you that I have still yet to meet. Um, we kind of came up with this idea two or three weeks ago as we started looking at COVID-19 and how do we still um, help our customers with issues that are concerning them and needs they have from sales. And one of the first ideas was, let's look at what products they're really focusing on right now and help those guys have the tools they need to sell and, and talk about those products. That's, that's something that normally would be done face to face. And, and what does that look like as we move into these uncertain times? So when I began to look at, at, at your company, I thought, you know, the two big things that you guys are facing right now um, as far as demand is, is, is breeder equipment, specifically being nesting and chain feeding. So that's what led us to, to our topic for today. And the first thing I wanted to do is, is just give you a brief overview of the, the nest types that we do offer. I know we've talked about a couple of these types um, back when I was still traveling, when I met with some of you guys, but you know, the real nuts and bolts of it is gonna be what Doug Berkey does and, and going through the different aspects of the nest. But I do feel like it's prudent to give you guys a, a good overview of the nest before we move on to that point. Um, we make several different types of nest, um, and we're gonna go through each of these, so I'm not gonna insult you by reading those, but, but we, we, we range all the way from the conventional hand gather all the way up to the freedom um, community nest, which we'll see at the end of this portion. Commit, conventional nest, you know, if you go back, and I'm gonna date myself a little bit and tell you how old I am, but if you go back to my early days in the chicken business, this was the nest you saw in a lot of the houses that we serviced. Um, hand gather system, uh, we have the, and these are still used some here in the U.S. in some small pockets and a fair amount um, internationally. They're easy to assemble, they have uh, galvanized bottoms, and then hinge perch closures. So one common thing that you're gonna see moving ahead in nesting is, is hinge closures and or some type of closure system because the industry has started to see that that's of a great deal of importance. The next generation of nests that, that came along and that we still offer today and sell a fair amount of is a center belt nest. And I wanted to make sure we spent time on this nest particularly because I know um, especially in Cassville, we've quoted some of those and, and we've got some real opportunities with this nest. This nest is made up of an eight inch center belt nest, um, center belt uh, with coated wire bottoms. And the coated and wire bottoms is a pretty key element of this nest. Um, early on in the history of this style nest, many people were using uh, galvanized wire bottoms and, and we found pretty quick that those, those don't last real long. The other thing to go along with that bottom is that I don't have a bullet point there for is that we use um, cold roll rods to support that nest bottom. Early in the life of a nest of this type, we used galvanized lips which rusted out and, and made the longevity of this nest not so good. So the longevity was greatly improved by using rods to set that nest bottom on. They do have a gradual slope uh, to allow the eggs to roll out. You'll notice on the bottom there's an arrow. We, we do have a hinge perch option for this nest. If you'll notice the, the height of the front of that nest um, is a little higher than would be comfortable for a bird to enter and exit that nest. So there's two options. One is to use our hinge perch. Two is to use ramp slats. We're perfectly good with either option, but, but the, one of the two of those must be considered. And then we have a steep roof with, with um, the, if you notice on the very top of that nest with an anti-roost guard, does a very good job of keeping birds from roosting and, and littering up the nest. And then as equally important as anything on the nest is, is large ventilation holes. Uh, those birds are generating a lot of heat, especially shortly after feeding time when, when their body's trying to digest food um, and, and lay begin. So it's, it's critical that you have good ventilation through these nests. Second is our side belt nest. Side belt has become predominantly the preferred nest in the U.S. for, for breeder hens. Uh, 
main difference here is is that it's made up of two four inch belts out on the side. Uh, this is a nest that that we've had great success with, and and I would put second to none as far as quality and performance of this nest. If you'll notice at the top of that nest, we do have hinge close out. That is a standard, does come standard on our nest. Um, and, and we've also, as, as of late, integrated an automatic closure system for this nest. There's been a, a great deal of research done on the cleanliness of egg pack, the control of salmonella, control of contamination on those eggs with the use of, of closeouts and preventing that bird from roosting and, and depositing manure in that nest at night. Um, and then again, Ventilation, ventilation, ventilation. I can't preach enough on how, how much that's important in a nest. As a matter of fact, um, this nest is a longer nest. It's eight foot versus five foot on the center belt. So the, the tops are cut back to allow some better ventilation to come through that nest and allow the birds to be more, more comfortable. We do employ molded plastic bottoms in this nest. The molded plastic bottoms, um, last a very long time, there's, there's nothing to rust, and they are contoured to help uh, the bird feel comfortable as she's um, roosting in this nest. And then one question you'll, you'll pretty commonly get when you're quoting nest is what type of pads you offer. We do offer turf and rubber finger pads for your customer's needs. And then this is one that, that's really starting to pick up steam for Valco. We're, we're quite proud of this product and we called it our comfort nest. And the long and short of it is we've basically taken every other partition out of this nest. Now that's not quite as simple as it seems. There's engineering that has to be done to strengthen the bottom and, and change the contour of the bottom. But as these birds are, we find that these board, birds are more and more communal. Uh, these birds, in a traditional side belt nest, will stack as many as three birds in a nest hole. So it caused us to question, what do we do to combat that? What do we do to make this bird more comfortable? And this is, this is the answer that we've come up with. And we've, we've been, done extensive trials with integrators around the country and, and are, are finding great success. And you know people are starting to talk about community nest versus standard nest. And we feel this is a good segue to allow that bird to be comfortable, to give you the same great features that you get with a traditional side belt nest and, and gain some performance in the process. And then the final type of nest that I'll mention is our community nest. Um, community nest that, that Valco offers come available with a flat top or a shingle top. Um, these can be high rise or floor mounted. We've seen some demand as of late for people wanting to go slatless in some of their breeder facilities. And this nest allows you the, the opportunity to either go slatless or stay with, with a traditional top. They are washable with plastic tops and partitions, which are, are a plastic material to help with biosecurity. And they do help with noise reduction because of this, this material makeup. Um, perforated poly mats and heck, hence the egg cleanless. And that's one thing we, that, that really needs to be a focus when you're looking at any type nest and selling any type nest is, what does the perforation on that, that nest bottom look like? You know, we use a, a, a pad that's got a large perforation in it that allows manure to easily pass through the nest pad. And, and again, helps more with egg pack. It's, it's all about pr producing a good clean egg that'll hatch well and without disease and our nest pads do a great job of helping that. And then finally, we do use uh, galvanized wire and steel components for their bottom. Um, that's, that's a necessity when you're, when you're looking at the size of that bottom just for support and guidance. So that kind of wraps up our lineup of nest bottoms. At this point, I'll turn it over to Doug Berkey and kind of let him give you some of the nuts and bolts and important stuff um, from a maintenance and operation standpoint on that nest. Thank you, Brian. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to this uh, new webinar. Uh, appreciate everyone taking part in this. And uh, hopefully everything we're going to do is going to help help you understand a lot more about the nesting and what, what uh, Valco can, uh, can offer as well. 
Um, as Brian described the nest, we're going to focus a lot more on the side belt nest, which is a very common uh, product. And uh, I'm going to kind of describe some things you really need to wash for when you're assembling or during use of the nest itself and during installation. Uh, when we are assembling these items, the nests, one thing to focus on is we have four holes down here on the side of it that are more specific for holding up. It's for those rods that Brian described in the center belt previously, the rods that support the, the water bottoms, the nest bottoms. And on a standard side belt nest, whether it be a 16 hole or a 20 hole, um, you wanna make sure that you use the inner two most holes to rivet those rods to. That'll give the proper support to the plastic nest bottoms. If you are assembling a comfort nest, which has wire bottoms, it's gonna, it's gonna metal wire bottoms, gonna have a much wider opening. You wanna make sure you use the outer two most rod holes for those. That will give the proper support for the wire bottoms. Again, the 16 and 20 hole traditional side belt nest, use the inner two most holes. And for the large comfort nest, large opening, you wanna use the outer most holes. Another thing we want to focus on is the uh, egg deflectors inside these nests. Um, as we open up the lid on this nest, you have a number of components inside here. You got your egg belt running through. You have your egg deflector right here in the, in the front. And some of the, some of the I items you need to watch for on this when assembling them is you can't really see it as well right here, so I'm going to focus on a separate piece. This is the egg deflector before it's installed into the nest. We have embosses or extrusions on either side of this component that they fit inside this groove of the cross member. And what that does is that helps keep it from rotating. Um, if that rotates, that gives you egg problems uh, with the ro not rolling properly. Uh, the birds might not go into the nest, may be frightened as everything may not sit properly, may not be steady. So always make sure that these bosses or those extrusions are inside this groove of this cross member right here. Also, when, when installing this unit, um, there is a center rivet hole. You can see it's pivoted, we pivot around the rivet right there in the center. And one thing to look for is you wanna make sure the rivet head is on the back side of, of the egg deflector. If we can get that view in here real briefly possibly. You can see the rivet. We want to make sure you rivet from inside the nest. Um, that gives a larger washer head on the plastic uh, versus putting it from the outside. The, the largest, most component you want to get the softest material on this. That way it holds it properly. Also, uh, some components with this we want to watch for is we have tabs on this, on the back side of this. These tabs hold. See if I can hold this better. These tabs hold the nest bottom down, hold it in place. So as you can see right here, we have a tab that hold that goes on top of the slot or the slant of the plastic nest bottom. And again, that holds the nest bottom down in place. Okay, so the next thing that we wanted to talk about, and I know Doug lacks a little bit finishing up on the nest, and and what we'll do is we'll let him cover both when he comes back. Um, Next thing I want to talk about was I just want to talk a little bit about, about fabric belts versus poly belts. And the reason I wanted to make sure that we spend a little bit of time on this is, is more and more integrators are starting to require, to allow the poly belt as an option and even require it um, for our nesting systems. So I wanted to make sure that we touched on this and gave everybody a little bit of an overview as to what we're looking at poly versus fabric. Um, everybody's seen the poly belt, everybody's seen fabric belt, but these are the two type belts that we do offer for our nest. I wanted to spend most of the time here talking about the, the polypropylene belts. Reason being, fabric belt is, is, is a tried and true product. I don't think it needs a, a whole lot of our time, but I do feel like as we try to gain more familiarity with the poly belts, that it is important to, to go through that and talk, talk through that. These belts are less porous, um, and this is huge on, on bacteria growth. As we see integrators more and more concerned 
about salmonella, as we see more and more integrators concerned about chick quality, as we see more and more integrators concerned about egg pack, this, pot, this belt uh, greatly reduces those bacteria and those challenges that, that are oftentimes found. Because trust me, there's, a lot, there's enough challenges in a hatchery without adding the, the poor egg pack as part of that. These belts are also easier to clean. And I encourage people all the time when I sell these belts, cleanliness, you know, it's kind of like the old saying I was taught in grade school, cleanliness is next to godliness. And there's a lot to be said for that, even in the egg world. Um, these egg belts need to be cleaned and disinfected daily as, as manure gets on the belt and stains the belt, as um, eggs bust on the belt and, and, and create bacteria on the belt. And it's much easier to clean this smoother surface. And then secondary to that, your table, your, your rollers, your drive components will operate much more efficiently with clean belt than they do with dirty belt. Which all this leads to obviously cleaner eggs. And then one thing I wanted to point out at the top that we've done with our nest, and we've, we've had this feature for a long time, but is, is the clean out holes in the trough in the picture on the top left. It's essential to have these holes in there so manure does pass through, the manure is able to get off the belt, and able to keep you that cleaner environment for your eggs. And then obviously, what does all this do for us? Better hatchability. And that's something to really key in on when you're talking to your customers and, and focusing on selling this nest, because that, that feature alone is where a lot of, a lot of these uh, breeder growers get paid. You know, they get hatch bonuses, they get feed conversion bonuses, things of that nature. And the more good chicks you can give this, this customer, um, the better his hatchability bonus is and the better he's going to like your system. So, so this is a good feature to sell when you're, when you're talking to customers um, about NEST. And then the other thing that we do, and I'm going to let Doug talk a little more about this, but I wanted to give <clears throat> kind of an overview is, is we've designed an automatic take up to, to go with our poly and ba poly belt. Doug's going to tell you how, um, this belt expands and contracts with temperature variations. But, but what we've chosen to do is we've tried to, we've chosen to automate that system and put that up in the control room with your egg table. I know that some of our competitors have chosen to do that manually. Some have chosen it to do at the end of the house. But we feel like that that take up system needs to be in that control room where that grower is spending all his time watching and, and, and monitoring this system as he's running that belt. So this take up in itself is probably one of the key features in trying to sell this nest um, to your customers. And to go along with that, and Doug will show you some of the reasons why, but I believe our table is second to none um, in the breeder industry that you see here in this picture. This table is heavier, this table is more, more robust, which are all key elements to keeping the, the belts lined up, to keep them tracking properly, and to give that grower that long-term use out of his equipment that he expects. Um, if Doug's back on, I'm gonna turn it back over to him and let him go further. We'll get back, uh, since we got cut off a little bit, I'll go back to the, uh, the egg deflector and the nest bottom just a little bit. As we were talking, um, I was saying we got the tabs, we have that extra hole here. One other thing we wanna look at on a nest bottom is the bottoms have these little hooks, these little lips on them. It goes inside the slot of the trough. That way it holds it in place. And, and also, we're always talking about making sure we're not getting everything rotating. It keeps everything straight and flat and level. Um, the less movement you're gonna have, the less issue you have with birds getting in and out and, and, and egg machines. Um, as Brian was just talking about the uh, belts, the fabric belts versus the polypropylene and the collection table, we look at the table we have here, we do have uh, a belt take-up unit installed on this as well. And we do have uh, a polypropylene belt on here showing us. One thing with this table as Brian described, very heavy duty, very strong unit. Uh, we wanna make sure that it's, it, it's the best unit, the strongest out there because, as Brian said, if you have to be trying to keep everything in line, keep everything straight, um, with it being heavy, it's very difficult to maneuver. If, if a belt gets tightened, it's not going to try to 
move the table and turn it on an angle or anything. It's very heavy and holds its place. And um, as we talk about, as Brian was just talking about with the, the poly belt and the belt take-up system we have on here, uh, what this does, I'm going to take this protective guard off right now. And it shows the counterweight system that we have on this unit. Um, and what it, what it does is, what Brian said, it's an automated system. It's all done by gravity and weight being kept on the belt. Um, as the belt is being plastic, as it warms up, as the temperature warms up, plastic will give, it will elongate, uh, expand, and in doing so, the belt will get loose. Well, all the weight will, if you have these weights on there, it keeps tension on the belt at all times. Um, when the temperature drops, um, starts to get cooler, your belt is gonna contract a little bit. So that weight, when the belt shrinks if you want to say that way we just kind of come up so it's constantly keeping pressure on there we have two weights on there along with we have a slide mechanism inside the tape when installing the belt um, you want to make sure that it's tight very tight the very first time you install we want it tight all the time but when you install it the idea is to pull it tight so both counterweights are up as high as they can go and the slide mechanism inside the table is all the way to the front. It's forward to the table. That gives it a lot of time, a lot of length um, of your belt to stretch. It will stretch during use, but also as things warm up, it'll start to elongate, it'll start to expand. So it allows plenty of space, plenty of room for the counterweights to, to drop with the expansion of the belt, but yet at the same time, keeping proper tension on the belt. Um, that's what you want to do at all times. You make sure that belt is tight. So you want to make sure you have plenty of distance for these, these weights to move back and forth. Um, with the table itself, how the, the main operation with it and the design of it, we have a number of, of components we can discuss on here. One thing with the table is we have the protective guards over the drive rollers where the belts are coming through. And there are times where you have to clean things up, you have to turn everything off, you may have to do a little bit of maintenance, getting feathers or debris out of there. These covers, they stay in place, they're very solid, but they're spring-loaded in the design that they can come off with very little ease. And it's just so easy to get those off and get access to it as needed. Um, so, you know, little weaker hands can't get it off, but they do install and come off very easily, very quickly. Real nice option with these units. The drive control is out of the way. It's up on the mounting table or up on the rack table. That way it, you're, you're never encountering it when, when you're trying to grab eggs, or you're trying to move your flats and everything. It's not in the way at all. So it's uh, easily accessible, but yet, not in any you know, protruding way whatsoever. Um, we have large litter buckets uh, to catch the debris off of here. There are brushes underneath the belt drive rollers that help clean everything off before it gets through. So we're always trying to make sure, as Brian said earlier, keep the, the belt as clean as possible. You know, you're preventing bacteria. So we do have brushes, dual brushes, that will keep brush all that stuff off and push it into the litter buckets. When you're operating the table, and we say we make it a heavy table because we got to make sure the belts are in line and they, nothing moves, well, the belts can track back and forth given how the whole house is built and how time, temperature, operations make things you know, move on their own. So you want to track the belt very straight, and we have just little adjustment bolts right in the front of the table on both sides for either belt. All you need to do is loose the four bolts on the bearing, on the outer bearing, and then adjust, rotate, just turn that bolt, either left or right, depending on what direction it'll make the belt go. All you, what it's happening is it's either pulling, this air is pivoting that shaft this way, or it's pivoting that way, and that'll make sure that belt tracks back and forth. When you get to where it's need, needed to be, tighten everything back down, and you're ready to go. 
that's what we have on the collection table and the side belt nest. And we'll go ahead and give it back to Brian. Hey, Doug, before we move on, while you're looking at that table, can you explain for these guys, because a lot of people are going to a cross conveyor transfer system, what the difference in the table is for a cross conveyor, as well as the space considerations needed for the take up? Good. Yeah, we're muted. No, you're good. All right, Brian, um, that's a good point. This collection table that we call drive, belt drive door collection table, depending on what application you're using it for, but it is designed that it can be used with mounting against a cross conveyor as well, where you can take these covers off. This belt guy, this egg gun, I'm sorry, will be removed, and there'll be two brackets, two angles that'll go across here that'll guide the eggs, and you can put we have uh, cross conveyor fingers on here as well that'll just transfer the eggs onto the cross conveyor. So the same unit can be mounted and, and used with the uh, cross conveyor system. It just depends on how you want to uh, have it set up. Um, with the belt take up, we're going to need, you know, this is it's a small, we want to give this as small as you can, but we do need 18 inches here. But again, as I said earlier, is the maximum, you want to get the maximum height possible because that allows the, the counterweights to travel a lot longer before you may have to adjust the, the belt. You may have to shorten it and, and reconfigure it. Flat chain feeders, now that, now that I've got it where everybody can see it. And if you go back a couple of years, we started seeing a, a trend of people wanting to go to pan feeders for breeder hens. Uh, feed costs were a big concern and the, the common thought process and proven um, theory is that, that there are some feed savings to be realized with pan feeders versus chain feeders. The, the one given to that though is that we weren't, we weren't given a whole lot of thought to performance. We assumed that performance would be very similar but weren't 100% sure there. What a lot of integrators have started to see in is they feel like they've seen some performance suffering as a result of the chain, as a result of the pan feeders. There's a lot of reasons that can be li listed. Um, some of the theories that have been thrown out there have to do with um, the ability, the way that that feeder runs out the feed, the timeliness that it runs out the feed, the abilities for the roosters to be able to rob. But for that reason, a lot of people have started shifting back somewhat to a, to a chain feeder. And we've made a lot of improvements to chain feeders over the years. We've done things to improve maintenance of our chain feeders. We've increased delivery speeds um, to 90 feet a minute and even as high as 120 feet a minute. And what we've done with the chain feeder is we have greatly improved the availability of feed that was not there with some of our chain feeders of the yes, of yesteryear, um, which led us into an independent direct drive. Um, belt drive for many, many years has been the preferred method of chain feeder. It's still the preferred method of chain feeder in many segments of our market. We're very proud of our, our belt drive system. Some of the things that come along with a belt drive system though are is, is obvious belt wear and break You've got to worry about pulley wear. And then the other thing is, is, is all that kind of compounds when you go to these faster speeds like 90 and 120 feet a minute, like I'm talking about. So what I've made an effort to, to encourage my customers to, to take a look at are, are these independent direct drives. Um, you've got a, a, a direct gearbox mounted to the motor, um, which eliminates pulleys, belts, all the considerations that we talked about as, as kind of the flaws of a belt drive chain feeder. Again, a belt drive chain feeder is, is great, but we're always looking to improve and do just a little bit better and, and offer our, our customers that long-term solution. And then a couple of the other things is you, you're able to offer a more consistent speed for that bird. You know, anybody that, that spent a little bit of time in breeder uh, operations realize that that consistency and 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 normalcy in that chicken house are the two things that those birds are looking for and when you don't have belts to worry about you don't have pulleys slipping to worry about then that greatly enables you to improve your breeder program 
And then the other thing is, is the chain is able to be positioned in such a manner that you can pull out of that hopper. Uh, it's, it's quite important to be able to pull, pull out of that hopper, position your feed terminals where you want them, and lay out that house as you see fit, which leads me to the auxiliary hopper. We've got a couple of different types of auxiliary hoppers. One is a single line drive hopper, um, and, and second is we do offer a two line auxiliary hopper. Those hoppers work, work very well and allow integrators to position their houses and lay their feeding out in their houses in, in many different formats as desired. And then again, the, the other thing we offer, because we see large variations across the spectrum of different types of grill, we offer a number of variations of grill spacing, both horizontally and vertically, and in the different desired profiles. So it's, it's very hard to look at a spec and not be able to figure out and lay out anything that the integrator desires. And that's, that's kind of the focus that we've, we've tried to achieve here with our different layouts on chain feeders. And with that, I'll uh, get out of this presentation and turn it back over to Doug and let, let Doug um, give us a little bit of the maintenance and other considerations to go with the chain feeder. All right, Doug. Thank you, Brian. Um, yeah, and as, we, as Brian is discussing flat chain feeding, I'm gonna discuss some of the components that you need to focus on and how to maintain them, what to look for, and uh, make sure everything is operating properly. Uh, one thing we'll start off with is proper chain tension. Um, if you have a loose chain, um, you're going to start getting what they call caterpillaring, where the chain is going to start buckling up, and that will just cause a lot of issues. You could cause damage to your drive system. You won't carry the feed properly. Um, so we want to focus on the, the, the chain tension. And one thing to look for, you, you want to do this periodically throughout the operation, obviously during installation, but throughout the operation of the unit of the clock, is you want to be able to lift up on a chain roughly an inch and a half. And normally you would do that roughly a foot from the drive unit, pull the chain up, and you should, you should be able to lift it up an inch and a half. If you're lifting up much more than that, two inches, two, three inches, it's too loose, you may have to look at uh, removing a length or two. Um, and always remember as I'm doing this, we always make sure that you stop the power to unit at the circuit breaker before you do any maintenance on any of these automated systems. Um, another thing we want to look at is on the corners, the flat chain corners. They're a, they're a major component of these that we really need to focus on. And to keep them operating smoothly and, and, and very well, is you need to make sure that you keep the uh, corner post wheel or oil accordingly. Um, it's a very lightweight, 10 weight oil that you would put in these. And all you need to do is you remove the thumb screw on the corners, on the cover, and you just put a few drops of that 10 weight oil inside that threaded hole. And what that does is that, that uh, gets enough lubrication in there for the corner wheels inside that corner post. And you would need to do that every 30 to 60 days. That makes sure that everything is running very smoothly, very freely. Um, another thing to look for in the corners is, again, make sure power is, is not on to these systems, but you need to make inspect the inside of the corners as well. Make sure there are no foreign objects inside of them. Make sure everything is clean. Um, there's no, you know, mice, dead mice, carcasses, or anything like that, no debris, dirt, what have you, and make sure if the only thing is in there is feet. If you get different objects in there, you could start to damage the wheel. It'll try to move the chain uh, out of place. It could uh, put extra load on your drive system and cause uh, quite a few problems. Uh, flat chain drive system. We want to focus on that as well, the drive sprocket. And what we have here is we have a direct drive unit, not a belt drive, but I'm utilizing it for uh, better clarity, better video of this. And one thing to really focus on is the teeth of the drive sprocket need to be engaged in the chain properly. And what we have here is we do have, maybe difficult to see, you have that black steel, the power shoe underneath there. And what that does is that raises the chain up to the proper height to get engaged with, with the sprocket. Now, throughout time, throughout use, 
that power shoe can get worn. So again, you need to verify this periodically. Make sure that the teeth are engaged with the chain. If that power shoe is worn and the chain in the, is lower from the sprocket, and you get a lot more gap, these teeth may ride on top of these knuckles, the knuckle of the chain. That could be very damaging to your system. It could, it could damage your transmission, ruin your motor. Uh, obviously, you will not be able to move the, the chain and the feed in the, the manner that you, you need to. So always verify that you have the proper engagement with the chain and the drive tooth of the sprockets. And with that, I'll uh, give it back, give back to uh, Brian and Sean. Thank you. All right, thank you, Doug. Um, that concludes most of the presentation part that we had. Doug, if you wanna leave your video on though, some of the questions that I've got, you, you might wanna be able to point things out on. So I'll put you on the spot here a little bit. If anyone has, I've got a few questions that have, that have come in that we'll go through. Um, if anyone has any other ones, just go down to the chat function and type them in right there. And I will slot them in as time allows as we run up to, uh, to the hour here to try to respect your time. So Doug, the, the first one that came in just since you're talking about chain tension and you had the direct drive unit there, is there a difference um, in how you look at the chain tension on a direct drive unit versus a belt drive unit or where you check it or how much pull up there should be? Uh, no, the chain tension is the same on any type of system. Um, you just need to verify that the, you, like, as we said earlier, you can pull that chain up maybe an inch and a half. Um, but it, whether you're using a direct drive system or a belt drive system, the chain tension is the same on both. And is it just, would you still check it? You talked about checking it at the hopper for the belt drive. Would you check it by the direct drive then for the, that one or at the hopper still? I always stick in front of the, uh, or behind as you want to say, the, uh, the drive system itself. Because that's where the tension, that's where the sprocket is holding the chain in place. So it's not necessarily from the hopper, it's from the drive, wherever that drive component is. Okay. Um, next question, probably more of a Brian one. What's with the turf and the rubber fingers, you mentioned that we had both of them. Is one of them better or is one more popular than the other? Uh, I, my personal preference from my experience in live production is turf. And to go along with that, I would say that probably 75 to 80% of sales are for turf pads. It's a very small segment of the market that demands rubber fingers. And then I'll, I'll, I'll be quite honest with you, the rubber fingers about placement cost and longevity. Um, most people do prefer the turf and, and feel like they see better results with the turf. Okay, thank you. Jumping over, since we're, we're looking at the nest there, uh, or the collection table for the nests there, you talked to some of the, the stuff about it. You brought up maintenance on the nest and you showed the covers. Um, was there anything else maintenance-wise on the nest that would set this one apart? Like everyone, everyone's got a collection table. So is there something on this collection table maintenance-wise that sets it apart from the other ones out there? Um, another thing to focus on possibly is the tensioner on the pinch roller. Um, we have an automatic system on there, we're spring loaded. And what we can do is, the idea of what we have on these new tables is you want this, the, the bolt itself loose. You want the spring to be doing all its pressure, all its the work on it. That keeps the proper tension of that pinch roll against the driver roll. Um, so that's one thing that really steps us off that it's automatic, uh, it, it's, it, there's really no adjustment needed with that unit. Um, again, with, as we said earlier, it's just heavier built. Um, we have, you know, we have a, an adjustment on the, the rack on top where you can have a height with it, different heights allowed with it. We also have a, uh, a fluorescent light with it as well. Um, so those are the main things with the, the nest itself or the table itself. It is a direct drive system. Um, we have a motor. Yeah, Mike, if you want to take that, please. As you see, it is a direct drive system. Um, we have the motor and gearbox right up front here. Um, it's everything is accessible, very accessible. We have chain coupled uh, 
items here connecting their gearbox to the drive shaft. And what that does, it gives a little bit more flexibility when you're tracking that belt, when I was describing earlier, when you're kind of pivoting everything, it gives, it allows that to pivot much easier. Uh, so everything is very accessible on this table. Okay, thank you. Sticking close to there, um, you talked about the, the spacing before, I think, but just to reiterate one question that came up, if somebody has fabric belts now, can they switch to the poly belts or what would they have to do or is it a different, different setup that way? Normally with, if they're using the woven belt, the fabric belt, normally no one would use that belt take up system. So if you do put in a poly belt, you must have that take up system on there. Um, it, is, it is required. Uh, because because that belt is flexing as much as it does and when you do that you will need to pull that table away from the wall uh, enough space to get that belt take up system in there like I said I believe it's 18 inches I'm not sure what that is metric but uh, uh, that's that's what's necessary to do that okay so you're basically using everything the same you just have to scooch the table and put that take up in and you can add, jump to the poly belt from the fabric thank you correct that is correct uh, Question is here. What's the what's that PVC pipe sticking on the side of the nest? That um, that's not something that we have seen before. The pipe on here. Um, people have been using that. And there's a lot of issues throughout the years where many birds are getting inside the nest themselves. They can't quite fit. Um, there's some the larger birds, but the, their heads are just really going in there. When they're laying eggs, and they're not necessarily going into the nest. They would get some that would catch right here and sit there by the perch pool. So we're adding this pipe that is just enough when the egg, when the egg uh, is laid, it'll actually roll back inside. Um, we have a kit that comes with brackets that mount directly with the perch board on our nest. All you do is you order the kit, you supply the pipe, and uh, you can mount that directly with the nest itself. It's tied to the cover of the belt trough, so it's all part of the nest itself. You do not have to connect it to the nest in a different manner. It's, it, it's designed to be a part of the nest. Okay, next question. Do, is there a, do we have a maintenance guide for the belt drive feeding system? There is, inside the manual, there are uh, things to watch for. Uh, the guide of how often to you know, change your oil, how to maintain the different components. Um, so there is there is a basic guide inside the user's manual of the flat chain. Okay. I, we One thing to note, Sean, is that I don't think we've mentioned is we do have access to all of our manuals online at valco.com. Um, if anybody needs that, please reach out to me and I can send a link to that so uh, you can have access to all those, those manuals. We also do have um, a checklist, just a one page uh, kind of monthly, weekly, yearly checklist of things to look at for flat chain feeders specifically. Um, we'll be sending that out along with the side belt nesting checklist after this meeting to all of the, all of the participants, just so you have that um, as well. And when we send that out, we'll include that link that Brian was talking about. Um, last question so far, unless anyone has any more, feel free to chip in. But the last question that we had was uh, going back a long ways to the beginning here to the automatic um, nest closures. You, you mentioned an automatic nest closure, but how does that work? What do you have to do to make that happen? And how, does, how do you use that? Uh, with the nest closures, specifically on the side belt nest, we do have a kit, and it's a closure kit we have. Uh, steel springs that can be added to the nest itself to the covers and those are always keeping the nest closed itself and the whole kit includes components that can mount it to the nest and tie up to a winching system whether it be a hand winch or an automated winch tied to a house control and what that does when that winch opens up when a winch activates at certain whatever times during the day it opens up the nest and you do not have to walk down the nest and manually flip and the lids open or close you know, each time each day. Um, the winch will do it, the winch system will do it automatically if you have it tied to a, uh, a whole house control. Okay. Uh, oh, one more question popped in here. 
is there what speed is recommended for the flat chain in different applications and are there any special operational considerations at the different speeds i'll speak to that one sure. kind of, traditionally we've always been 60 feet a minute in breeders and pullets as well kind of the common um thought process now within most integrators is is 90 foot a minute for for pullets and for breeders um you run into a situation where uh birds aren't able to handle the chain speed uh, especially in pullets if you get above 90 the 120 is an option but it it's it certainly seems to do more damage to the bird than it does good 60 in a pullet application is is a no-go these days uh, birds want to pile and are, are quite anxious to eat more so than ever before so i think kind of the industry standard now has moved to 90 feet a minute for both uh, pullets and breeders and then was there any uh, uh, maybe i missed it but were there any special operational considerations at the different speeds that you need to be concerned with or is it just the application that you're talking I think it's primarily the application that you need to be concerned with. Um, breeders are going to have grill, so there's not a lot of, of concerns there with the high speed. The biggest thing in pullets, especially when you go to the higher speeds, is, is making sure you're careful to, to have corner chick guards. Those corner guards become more and more crucial the faster you go. I mean, those, those chicks have a tendency to want to stand on that chain and ride. At times, not all of them, you'll have just a handful get in there. So I, I think the main consideration there is, is gonna be your, your chick guards. And then secondary to that, as the begin, birds begin to age, it's gonna be your, your feeder line height. It's, it's essential to maintain a, a proper feeder line height. And quite honestly, we could spend a half a day talking about feeder line height, but I, I certainly would would recommend that you encourage your customers to to seek their integrator opinion and, and expertise on that because it's that's that's a big deal okay thanks brian i, I know we also do have um we do have the uh, variable frequency drive for people that want to be able to do a slower chain in some aspects and have a higher chain speed at different times of the grow out period as well um, so that can also be an option to discuss or if an integrator is not familiar with that concept to discuss with them. I think for now, that's all we have on questions and we'll wrap up right on time. So thank you to our presenters, Brian Phillips and, and Doug Berkey. Thank you to all of our attendees. As I mentioned, we'll be sending out audit checklists um, just as uh, little reminders and partial maintenance guides for the product we talked about today. Many more things can be found on valco.com, val-co.com. I'd like to thank everyone and please stay safe and wash your hands. Thank you. Take care. Thank you guys for your attention. Appreciate it. Thank you.